Hello. And yes, the hubs are back and they're back in these two unicycles, a Flansberium G24 and a Flansberium G29er. I'm going to run over these unicycles and explain what they are, how they've been built up and also highlight hopefully useful information for anyone dealing with these hubs, looking forward to these hubs. Basically just a bit of an insight into how they've, how they've gone so far in terms of building them. The hardware on both of these, they share some similarities. So we've got Mad for One saddles, Mad for One seat posts, then a blue clamp, triple bolt clamp, really like these clamps. Then we're going down to the Flansberium frame. This is an amazing frame. It's beautifully made. I like the design of it. Um, I've, Jacob does a really nice thing where he offers custom engraving on the inside of these forks. And if anyone knows how a schlump works, the right side is the area you push the gold button to shift it up, and the left side is the one you shift down. So my engraving goes 1 to 1.5 on this side, and then on, on the left hand side we've got 1 to 1. And I really like that little touch there. To me that makes this feel very personal to how I've, I've focused on it and what I wanted to get out of it. It's paired to a Chris Holm 47mm wide free ride rim. I went for this actually purely because of the aesthetics, because of the uh, blue inside uh, rim tape. And I've got mounted on this uh, tyre that I sourced, basically new old stock. It's the, the Maxxis High Roller 24 times 2.7 inch tyre, which I'm really, really stoked to ride this one and use this one because it's not a three inch tyre, not as quite as big and heavy as that, let's say a little, little bit lighter. Um, but also I quite like that, that width tyre anyway. So that's that, and we've got the brakes on this one. I did manage to get a 180 rotor set up on this 24 inch wheel. We'll come to the issues in a minute, but it's a, a Hope Tech 3 E4 brake in blue with braided hose. Great brake, uh, nice, nice look as well, and it fits up here. I'm gonna, this is not the finished configuration for either of these. I'm probably gonna mount the handle up here on the handlebar, but for the moment it works fine there and you can reach it when you're riding from like down here. We are running Chris Holm 127s, 150s, dual hole cranks on both of them. And this is a beautiful pedal from One Up, their aluminium flat pedal in oil slick. Again, I did go for it because of the aesthetics. Uh, I'll show you it in high gear, show you it spinning around in high gear. Obviously you'll want to see videos in the future of me riding it. Yeah, I will ride it. Uh, but at the moment, that's, this is what I'm focused on. I'm focused on getting these things up and running and built as per my over-perfectionism. So yes, it runs smooth as silk. There's a slight bit of uh, friction drag because the brake has yet to bed in but it's, it's working really well. Um, so I'll, I'll run over now on, before we get to just touching on the slight subtle differences on this one, I will just talk about some of the issues we've had. There have been some, and I'll start with the, the least serious to the worst. <laughs> and you know, they're both working for me, so I'm, I'm in a happy place where I don't feel too worried about these being functional. But the, the least worst, is that spoke clearance on the forks here, well, on the non-disc side, can be a bit problematic for some frames or for some wheel builds. On this 29er, I had to take about 0.3 millimeters off, just, just here, a little tiny, little tiny line to allow the spoke heads to rotate around on these forks. This one didn't need anything, and that's probably good because of the spoke angle. Um, next area of, puzzlement for this these builds well actually it's it's been resolved in my head okay now the guidance that i've heard second hand from florian is that it doesn't matter which way around you lace this hub as in doesn't matter which way around the spoke heads what hole they go into you may remember from my other video that uh that i pointed out that the the, the flanges are countersunk but they're alternating countersinking yeah so one hole yes next hole flat one hole, yes, next hole, flat, and on the other side, it's, it's the opposite. Puzzling, why was that the case? Because on previous hubs, well, really old ones, that was the case, 
but then more more recent versions before this uh, they were both countersunk, but one was slightly bigger, one hole was slightly bigger. Anyway, um, <clears throat> after lots of cogitation over that, lots of thinking and researching on, on how you would build a hub like this, I found a post on the internet, general wheel building guidance, that for older style hubs that tended to do this, where they had alternating countersinking, it said, do not put the heads into the countersink themselves. And that's interesting because I'd say count, the countersinking is counter, counterintuitive, yeah? So you would think that it looks like the space to put the spoke head in, but it's actually not. It's the purpose of the countersinking is to allow the J-bend, the curve of the spoke, to come out and not have a hard edge to cut into it or, or deform the hub itself. So <clears throat> after much discussion of that, these wheels have been built, as you probably know, by Ryan Builds Wheels of Bristol, UK, very local to me, 12 miles down the road, basically. Um, fantastically well built, fantastically uh, pretty attuned to working out how important these were for me. So I think Ryan picked up on that and basically he's gone and used washers on the non-disc side of the hub because this flange is remarkably thin compared with the disc side flange and he's used two spoke head washers on the, I'll show you, two spoke head washers on the spokes facing this way and on the spoke heads facing that way he's just used one and that's to give them somewhere to push into and make their own countersink in effect but also it takes up that space and makes for a very snug uh, spoke placement, there's not much movement and we can see really nice uh, placement of the J-bend coming out of the countersink there, which is in my... I never thought I'd be this this satisfied with this kind of uh, aspect of wheel building, but trust me, once I once you get so hooked on getting this A-OK, -okay, seeing it built within that kind of tolerance and that kind of perfection, it makes you very happy. And yeah, he was able to build these on a PN, PNK lie, truing stand, a really high-end truing stand, by putting the hub into high gear and then locking the axle into that stand. It's come out really well, and these are CX Ray bladed spokes in silver, which add a little extra in terms of clearance uh, for things around here. Plus, they just look nice, don't they? They are very, very nice spokes. So that is something I would recommend you look at, and I'm gonna leave links below. Well, there'll be a big link, <laughs> a big link, the link to the big thread where there's lots of discussions about the problems that people have had with these hubs getting them set up and there are some pending puzzlements that have yet to be really worked out as to how serious they are. Um, but that link you'll see there, that's the forum, but also I'll link to the page where I found really interesting guidance on how to lace hubs that have count countersinking on alternating hulls. It's worth knowing about faults, don't just go with what looks right check it out first. That takes us on to where things do get a bit more thorny and a bit more problemed, problematic. The rotor as it comes, it locks in here and the diagram that's provided in the manual, someone on the forum uh, was able to measure their hub and they discovered that their hub's measurements don't quite tally with what is depicted in the, the diagram. Um, I don't want to quote the numbers off the top of my head, but the TLDR of this is that there's about four mil, I think, missing, should we say, from the displacement of this rotor. And that leads us to washers. So for me to get this rotor to align with this caliper and for this caliper to not hit these spokes, I have to use two M4 times 12 millimeter washers. When I say two, there's obviously two per bolt, yeah. So there's nine bolts and there's two washers behind each bolt. But yeah, two washers thick, which brings that rotor out by a couple of mil. And by bringing it out a couple of mil, it aligns with the caliper. And the caliper obviously has some forward and backwards, like in and out alignment like this. Um, but you can't use that because if you were to push it in without those washers, you just crash it into the spokes and you don't want that. So the biggest issue with this entire 
hub is getting this caliper to align without hitting spokes. Um, I'm kind of kind of satisfied with the way it's aligned now because I've got probably just, I don't know, point, 0 0.6 mil clearance. It's not as much as you'd like. Yeah, you'd want probably one mil at least. But these spokes don't seem to flex and I don't think they're going to flex so much that they bump right into the corner of that rotor. I don't think they're not rotor, caliper. I don't think they're going to do that personally. And we're going to now wait and see how this is actually fixed, maybe in a more elegant way, because there is no mention of how to mount the rotor in the, the manual at all. So it's been left to people to kind of work it out for themselves. Washers make sense, but you know, two washers I'm kind of happy with, but it's still two, two millimeters further out. So maybe I need longer, longer bolts here. Maybe, I don't know. But if you, want, if you were building this hub on a bigger wheel, the bigger the wheel, the, the more need for clearance because the spoke angles get shallower. So if you're building a 36 inch wheel, even with a 203 rotor like this, so this rotor's using just one washer and I get clearance basically on par. But if I was building a 36 inch wheel on the same, same uh, width hubs, those spoke angles going all the way up to the rim even the 203 rotor puts the caliper still at a point where the spokes are closer, yeah? Um, how do you get rid of that closeness? Well, aside from moving this flange, which you can't, that would be re-engineering the entire flange construction, which I don't think we want to do. The fix is to bring this rotor disc further out that gets it aligned and by getting it aligned with the caliper we don't have the caliper hit the spokes yeah so the the missing four millimeters is basically the puzzle here as to why it's been that way why was it engineered why why did the hub get shipped to people with that slight discrepancy to what it says in the manual um am i too concerned not really but i would be concerned if i bought uh, a hub right now and received it and was trying to build a 36 inch wheel and needed to use four washers per bolt because then the bolt length just needs to be four millimeters longer and why weren't there washers in the box and all of that all of that stuff yeah so for an expensive hub kind of you just want answers and in a friendly way that's all it is i'm a huge fan of slump hubs it's probably being clear florian's personally a hero of mine because i think his engineering's exceptionally great it gives us something so unique, so special, and, and, and I think it's clear that those that ride geared unicycles tend to be, you know, I'm planning a cog tattoo on my wrist, yeah? That's how serious we're getting. So, so I like cogs, I like gears, and I like planetary gearing from Schlumpf Innovations. But fundamentally, at the same time, we also want it to work, don't we? Because it's a disc hub and we want calipers to align. So there's a bit of a, a bit of friction around that as to why it's not. But it will get solved, and it will get solved, I hope, in a really nice, creative way, where maybe, I'm just going to put it out there, I'm not an engineer, but maybe another piece can be machined that fits behind the rotor, and we get longer bolts, and that piece is a glove fit, so it's like another spacer in a sense. It's almost like another piece of this, this, this rotor, perhaps, that sort of slots in behind it. This whole end cap can even come off. I don't know if it's a press fitting, but if it isn't a press fitting and it just slides off, maybe that end cap type thing where this all fits can be removed and hopefully removed by customers like myself. You know, we get it in the post. We know how to do it. We know what torque tolerance is it should be set up to and we just undo it, put the new one on and hey, presto pass, we've got the right clearance levels. And there may even be a simpler option that washers are perfectly fine, get yourself longer bolts of this specification and Bob's your uncle. If that's the case, woohoo! It's simple, but we need to know. So that's the issues there. Other issues, I would say personally, I found a bit of an issue. I put these cranks on and behind this crank, there are these little rings which look like crank stops. Now, I think in the manual, they call them pressure rings. And after conversing or querying this with uh, Florian, I was saying, can I use spacers on these hubs? The answer really is no, you don't really need to use spacers. Why, why would you use spacers was, was how it was put back to me. 
And yeah, I, I, I can't say I understand because it's not how I understand putting on cranks, but fine. It turns out that the, the school of thought at work here is that these, these pressure rings are in actual fact a sort of prevention of damage to the bearings. So were cranks to get really sloppy and worn and loose and people were to tighten them and tighten them and tighten them until they started pressing in. Without those pressure rings, they would just press into the bearings and mangle them and mess them up, yeah? So that wouldn't be good. Hello, thunder. Uh, yeah, we've got torrential rain here. That's why I'm indoors videoing this. Um, but what was I saying? Pressure rings, yeah. So these pressure rings are there to actually catch any inadvertent crank tightening that gets closer and closer to the bearings. That's my understanding of it. So I've put two mil spacers on because I wanted to close that gap. I'm not worried about them being there, to be honest, but uh, they're not they're not firmly gripped. There's a slight I can slightly move them. Um, and that leads us on to the, the area that left me with the most pain when building these wheels, which was tightening the axle bolts. Um, I tightened them with a handheld tool about this big, little tiny tool. I was kneeling, I wasn't leaning, I wasn't putting my body weight into it at all. And I gave them a good grease, the cranks and the axle, before putting them on. And I went carefully, I'll hammer it. I don't have a torque wrench. The manual says you can crank these up to 55 newton meters, 45 to 55. Okay. I don't think I went anywhere near 45. I think I was way below that, probably more like 35-ish, yeah? Guesswork, but that's where I think, because I wasn't putting much weight into them at all. Um, and fundamentally, all that really happened was I noticed the, the bolt, I'll put a photo up there, the bolt did slightly deform under the load I was putting on it. And at that point I freaked out because I don't want to round them out because I want to be able to take them out. Um, and it did leave me with some pause. Florian has assured me via email that these bolts shouldn't have a problem. They're the toughest material available and they shouldn't be doing that. And they've never done that in the past on bicycles and etc. So fine. My experience does differ with that. And I don't think I was going hell for leather with a, with a big long Allen wrench or, or something and I wasn't brute forcing it. Um, so me personally, uh, I would be, if I was doing this again, I would be using a block of wood on one side, lay this down flat, make sure they've got grease on lots, I did do that, but put them down flat and give them a solid whack with a, um, a rubber mallet when both cranks are on, not one at a time like I did, and get them to really seat in there nicely as much as you can just using that whacking. And then Go slowly with a small tool using the provided bit tool because obviously that has you know the best fit for the bolt and go carefully don't don't go full hell for leather on it because if you right round it out and you can't get the bolt out I think that would be the most sad outcome of all of this build once you go to double money so that's my experience with the bolts it's the only thing that leaves me a little bit kind of disappointed maybe um, but there we have it. They're fine, they're on there. And it's news to me, but we don't need the cranks to press up against those pressure rings. They're there for when cranks wear and eventually do that by their own inclination. That's when they help prevent bearing damage. Okay, I think I've been fairly thorough on that. And I think that's basically all the problems that we've got some puzzlements over what are the measurements and why was it designed this way, that'll get ironed out. I'm in conversation with, you know, people who need to know and people on the forum are doing fantastic work all helping each other, you know, trying to, to, to fathom out what's gone on here. But let's just wrap up on a, a gloriously golden positive note with this piece. Yeah, I know. Two of them. I do understand it's excessive. I do understand that. Actually, yeah, I'll link to a specific post that explains why I've spent this money on these things. It's on the forum. I did acknowledge it because I think someone said, oh, I'm really jealous. And that's not the aim of me in any way. I just don't want to trigger that response in anyone. Uh, I'm obsessed with them. This is what I choose to spend my money on. And I like them for, for many reasons and they give me benefit anyway. So very much the same as this. The only real difference here is we're running a carbon fiber rim from Light Bicycle. 
the AM, yeah, AM935. 29 a rim, it's tubeless. This is the Recon Plus uh, 29 times 2.8 inch tire. It's a really light rolling rolling wheel now because that's so light compared with this, if you can feel it. Um, and I, I wanted to build a cross country style uh, ride because this is the more typical ride for a schlump in a sense, the sizing is more typical. Everything else is very, very similar the way the wheels were built. Pedals, I got second hand, uh, no longer made gold Hope F20s, which I think match the aesthetic. And outside of that, these are just like little and large. Purpose of this one, I can take the small one with me pretty much anywhere I go. It will go in a rucksack, the dedicated 24 inch rucksack and it can go in a, I can fly with it much more kind of conveniently, but this one is the one that I would just ride on the paths and tracks around here much more freely because of the general speed benefit uh, when in high gear and in low gear. So there is a reason to have the two different sizes. Um, obviously there's also like gear 36s, that's to come, but this beautiful wheel is, is incredible. I'll show you it running in high gear, not that you probably want to see a wheel spinning stage. So it's in high gear and it's buttery smooth. Look at that. I have to say, in spite of all of the little issues we're facing, I do feel optimistic that we're going to get them resolved. We're going to help each other build really exceptionally great wheels that stand the test of time and bring a lot of revolutionary joy to those in the monomania sphere of influence. Yeah, I said it. So, thanks for watching. Any questions, fire them my way. I am actually on Instagram, would you believe it? Yeah, Mind Balance CC. search for that. I think it's underscore CC or dot CC, I can't remember. Um, fire questions my way. Um, Join the forums, join in the debate, and keep it single-wheeled balancing. Peace out. Come on, you two. Let's get you upstairs.